Hello and welcome to this new course module dedicated to the presentation and publication of a research article. In the first part, we will cover how to structure an oral presentation of a research paper with PowerPoint support. The second part of this module will focus on how to prepare your paper for submission to a journal. The material presented here was prepared by Professor Sylvain Desi and is based on his experience in preparing a 20 to 30 minute presentation. Most of the examples are taken from empirical research articles, but the content can easily be used with a minor twist for applied theory or CGE modeling articles. That said, at the end of this module, you are expected to understand these aspects the purpose of an oral presentation, how to structure such a presentation, how to prepare your paper for submission to a journal, and how to choose a journal to submit to. How you structure your presentation depends on the time you have available. If you have an hour or more for your presentation, you may have more room to add content, which may change the timing of the information you give to participants. For example, you may add more slides to provide more information on the topic of your presentation, or you might have time to review the literature in which you are contributing. However, irrespective of the time allotted to your presentation, its structure remains the same. But here, I am assuming that your talk lasts 20 to 30 minutes, which puts a premium on the content of each slide. You spent six months to a year working on your research and found all these exciting results. But then, you only have 20 to 30 minutes to talk about what you did and what you found. So you may ask, how do I go about cramming all this hard work into such a brief time slot? Deciding what information to include in an oral presentation and how to organize that information can often be more stressful than actually giving the talk. To get started, you may want to answer a number of questions first, such as, why do you need to present your paper? What does the audience want to know? Who will be in the audience? Will there be some scholars who are familiar with your research area? Or will there be predominantly scholars who work in other areas? Addressing these questions seriously may help you give an excellent presentation. It is important to know what your audience wants to know. Based on the answers to these questions, you will want to make sure you structure your presentation with the appropriate depth and terminology. We touched on this issue in a previous module. The purpose of reiterating what we said before is to emphasize the need to prepare well before a presentation. Preparation is not just about reviewing your material and putting it together in a bunch of slides. Time's limited, so you want to avoid being asked distracting questions during your talk that only good structure and forethought can prevent. This starts with knowing what you are looking for in presenting your research. In a note, Cochrane and Cox, 2019, co-wrote about how to give a seminar presentation to offer a good perspective about the motive for presenting a research paper. You can find this note listed as a reference at the end of this PowerPoint presentation. Basically, you present a research paper to receive feedback so you can make changes and improvements on your work, help you understand your work better, impose structure and deadlines to help fight procrastination, and to promote your research to get exposure to the seminar culture and share your research findings with the scientific community in your field. There can be many reasons for presenting your work. Some of these motives may clash with one another. For example, it is natural that you want others to know about your research after you have completed it and have found something of interest. So promoting your research might be a primary motivation for presenting it. This motive, quite naturally, may drive your preparation in the content of your presentation, pushing you to emphasize promoting the implications of results for public policy over defending the scientific relevance of your methodological approach. However, if your research findings are preliminary, in the sense that they have not yet been reviewed independently, defending their scientific relevance during your presentation may be the main reason for presenting your research. 
This may impact both your preparation and the content of your presentation. You may want to put more emphasis on justifying and defending your methodology and less on promoting the implications of your results. Oriana Bandiera, a professor at the London School of Economics, thinks an excellent presentation strikes a balance between the two motives. Why? Because such a balance enables the presenter to factor in the participant's interest in his or her preparation. Of course, to promote your research or get feedback, it is necessary that your audience first understand clearly what your presentation is about, what you did, why it was important to do it, and what you found. Participants at seminars may have various and different motives for attending a seminar, but in general, the questions they tend to have in mind are the following. What research question is the author trying to answer? What methods does the author use to answer this question? And what is the author's answer, and does it make sense to me? Your preparation, therefore, is about how to best address these questions. You will see in what follows that addressing these questions dictates both the structure and the content of your presentation. So let's talk about the structure and content of a presentation. How you structure your presentation depends mainly on the type of paper you wrote. It could be an applied theory paper, a CGE paper, or an empirical paper. A general outline that can be adapted for every kind of paper reads as follows. First, it is important to have highly readable slides with good contrast between the words and the background. And second, basically your oral presentation should follow these guidelines. You open up the presentation with a maximum of two motivating slides. In the next slide, you state your research question and defend its relevance. Next, you use a maximum of two slides to highlight your contributions to the literature. Depending on the type of paper, you may present the theory, the model to be simulated, or your testable hypothesis. Here, you may need a minimum of five slides. If your, if your research uses data, then you should use up to six slides to present this data and the descriptive statistics. If your paper is empirical, you will want to describe your identification strategy. If it is a CGE paper, then you will need to describe your social accounting matrix. You may use up to five slides. If your paper is in applied theory, skip the preceding two steps to present your results directly. For CGE and empirical papers, state and explain your findings here. You may use up to 10 slides. Discuss the implications for publicity using a slide or two maximum. Oriana Bandiera, mentioned in slide 7, recommends the following format for presenting an empirical paper. The first two steps are identical to those of the general structure shown in the previous slide. Start by introducing your research topic using a maximum of two slides. Use the next slide to state your research question. Now the difference starts here. You use the next slide to summarize the literature to which your research is contributing. I will come back to that later. Next, use up two slides to preview your results and entice the audience to become interested in how you obtain these results. If you are testing hypotheses derived from a model, present these testable predictions here, even if you don't have a formal model. The remaining steps are similar to the general structure presented in the previous slide. Present your identification strategy in up to five slides. This next step is optional. Discuss the evidence of identifying assumptions mostly backup slides. Presenting your findings, up to 10 slides, then close with the takeaway, up to two slides. The first two steps are identical to those of an empirical paper. Introduce your study using a maximum of two slides. Then state your research question in one slide. For example, what policy impact are you assessing? Why is it important? The difference starts here. State the key outcomes of interest, for example, social welfare, environmental quality, etc. 
Then use up to 10 slides to present your simulation design. In up to 5 of these 10 slides, highlight the computational challenges. Use up to 6 slides to describe data for the SAM. Use up to 10 slides to present your results and discuss implications for policies. How you introduce your presentation can make you win or lose your audience's attention. So this is a critical stage in your presentation and you must rise to the challenge of winning your audience's attention. This is how Oriana Bandiera suggests preparing for the introduction slide. First, keep in mind that the audience is fundamentally disbelieving. So the important issue is, how do you hook them into your research? State the socioeconomic problem motivating your research, highlighting its importance. Often, showing a strong picture illustrating the damage caused by this problem will do it for you. For example, the ravage caused by drought, the sad face of a child bride, the sweat and toil of a victim of child labor, the damage caused by environmental degradation, etc. But note that not all socioeconomic problems can be illustrated with pictures. Discuss the importance of this socioeconomic problem. Who is affected? Where? And what are its consequences? Here is an example of how to structure the introduction slide. This example is taken from an online presentation by Professor Eric Maskin of Harvard University. In this example, the socioeconomic problem of interest is within country income inequality. Professor Maskin links this problem to a theoretical puzzle. Globalization has failed to produce income inequality, contrary to what was predicted by an international trade theory by David Ricardo. He also points out that low-skilled workers have been adversely impacted by increased inequality brought about by globalization in every country. So this is the social group affected by the globalization-induced income inequality. And this social group is found in all countries and more often represents the majority of the workforce, making it a global issue. To sum up, Professor Maskin attempts to win over his audience by convincing them that the socioeconomic problem his research is focusing on has broader implications as it is a global issue linked to international trade. An important challenge in doing research is to find a research question that many people want to know the answer to. Failure to rise to this challenge can seriously limit your audience and, as I will argue later, undermines your chances of publishing your resource in a prominent journal. Your presentation will generate interest and feedback if the audience finds your question interesting and relevant. In other words, if they are interested in its answer. Therefore, in thinking about how to formulate your research question, keep in mind that economics fundamentally influences public policy. Ask yourself the following question. How many people stand to benefit from the answer to my research question? Your research question must impact positively as many people as possible to draw in a significant audience. Successful authors, by that we mean those who have been successful at publishing in prominent journals, always defend their research questions as having broader implications. Here are a few examples. The first example is by James Fenske, a professor of development economics at the University of Warwick. His article was published in the Journal of Development Economics in 2015. Does increasing women's education lead to the disappearance of polygyny? Let me start by pointing out that Fenske answers this question using data from several sub-Saharan African countries. Yet it is clear that gender issues, of which polygyny is a significant contributor, are a salient feature of nearly all countries. Notably, both polygyny and women's education are crucial issues in the developing world, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, to the point where the UN turned Improving Women's Educational Outcomes, SDG 4, and Eliminating All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, SDG 5, into sustainable developmental goals. 
The second example is drawn from a paper by Professor Anastasia Samikina, Florida State University, published in the Journal of Applied Econometrics in 2018. Does motherhood increase women's self-employment? Defending the broader implications of this research question is not hard at all. Women's participation in the labor market remains a crucial issue globally. However, barriers to women's participation in the labor force may vary by country or region. We will end with a research question that is much broader in scope. It is drawn from a presentation given by Professor Eric Maskin of Harvard University. Does globalization increase within country income inequality? Income inequality is a persistent problem globally and has become a significant preoccupation of the international community. Indeed, the UN has decided to include the reduction of inequalities in its list of Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 10. Again, note that this research question can be answered using data from any country, a country in Africa, South Asia, Latin America, etc., or a group of countries. Yet, low-skilled workers are in high supply in developing countries, thus raising inequality within these countries. Irrespective of your research question, your audience also wants to know what you add to the literature. What is it that you do that was not done before? If your research question is novel enough, then answering it contributes to the literature. But what, in your research question, is a variant of a classic question? Then people want to know why you revisit it. That's why stating your contributions to the literature is crucial to getting the audience interested in your research. But how do you do it in a presentation? You state what your paper does. You want to do it in a way that indicates that it is something that others have not done before, otherwise it's not a contribution. For this reason, it is helpful to start by briefly stating what has been done in the literature. The purpose of this summary is to single out what the literature left out and explain, verbally, no need to put it in a slide, why including what was left out is so important. This example is taken from a paper written by Taryn Dinkelman, a professor at the University of Notre Dame, and published in the Economic Journal in 2016. I present new evidence that exposure to drought has a long-term adverse effect on a child's human capital in later life. I focus on estimating impacts on disability outcomes not typically studied in the early life shocks literature. I show that local environmental shocks in different parts of the world have different implications depending on gender. The content here depends on the type of paper you wrote. If it is a theoretical paper, present an overview of the environment or setting, describe the techniques used, for example, game theory, general equilibrium, etc. If it is an empirical paper, describe the model or hypothesis to be tested and the methodology used to analyze the data, highlighting the challenges to identification, if any. If it is an experimental paper, Describe the experimental design and the methodology used to analyze the data. If it is a CGE paper, present your social accounting matrix as well as the simulation design, highlighting the computational challenges, if any. In empirical research, the role of data is to answer the research questions identified by the researcher. The primary reason for presenting data is to demonstrate to your audience that you selected data most appropriate for answering your research question. Therefore, as a presenter, you want your data to highlight inherent correlations and relationships between your variables of interest. In that sense, presenting your data involves using a combination of tables and various graphical techniques to visually show your audience the relationship between different variables. You may take a slide to describe your data, naming the sources, explaining whether you have a panel, cross-section, or time series, and noting the number of observations. In the remaining slides, present descriptive statistics 
and relate them to your research question. Often use graphs and charts to present visual tests of your main hypothesis. Presenting your results or findings is about determining the main messages you want to communicate to your audience. In other words, what do you want them to take home from your work? Addressing this question can help you organize the content of your slides showing your results. In deciding which result or findings to include and which to leave out, you might want to consider the value added by each result or finding. Because the slides of your results are the centerpiece of your story you are telling, having more slides with less content on each is more likely to make communicating your results much more manageable than cramming all of them into one slide. Here is a simple rule Professor Bandiera of the London School of Economics recommends for presenting your results or findings. One finding per slide, the most important finding first, and it would be important that you had a logical path from one finding to the next. How you conclude your presentation is very important. You want your message to stay with your audience long after they exit your presentation. When it comes to summing things up, there are many tips available online. This is a summary of those I consider helpful. 1. Choose three or four points from the presentation and reiterate them. This is a great way to ensure that your main points are appropriately communicated and that your audience is walking away with the information you intended to convey. When summarizing the key findings, give them context and show the audience exactly how to support your main argument. 2. Repeating a theme or core message that was mentioned in the introduction can create a powerful conclusion. To an audience, it can feel like the speaker is coming full circle and will signal to them that the presentation is concluding. 3. If you have tremendous confidence in your findings, provide your audience with a clear and specific set of policy recommendations to take now that they are armed with the information from your presentation. Calls to action should include solid and active verbs. Now, let's talk about how to prepare your paper for publication. A key convention in the publication of research is the peer review process. It is a process through which your peers in the scientific community evaluate the quality and potential contribution of a manuscript you have written. That means after you have gone through the lengthy process of conceptualizing your research question, reviewing the literature, performing analysis, interpreting results, and finally writing a paper about it, the hard work is not over yet. In fact, it has only begun. You still have to invest time and energy to communicate the findings of your research to your audience. This is what publication is all about, to get your peers to validate your research findings. The high rejection rates in prominent journals and the waiting period for a publication decision makes it imperative to prepare for this ultimate test. Hence the importance of the following question. How do I get my paper ready for publication? I'm going to do my best to help you address this question in what follows. Let me start by outlining the different stages of the preparation process. 1. Identify your audience and determine what journals they have read. 2. Find out how the review process of these journals works. 3. Find out what they have published by reading their stated purpose as well as reviewing recent issues and identify a journal that best serves your purpose. 4. Read the journal's instructions to authors. And 5. Produce your manuscript according to the specific journal requirements. Who is your audience? The paper you wrote should help you answer this question. The title, abstract, and the introduction all help with this. There is a crucial reason why you should look at these three parts of your paper to identify your audience. Journal editors read these three parts of a submitted manuscript to establish whether it is an excellent fit for the respective journals. In essence, your introduction is a letter to your audience, summarizing the conceptualizing process that led to your findings. 
That means that when you write your introduction, you are selecting your audience. A strong introduction engages the reader in the problem of interest and provides a context for your study. In writing your paper, it is paramount that your introduction paragraph presents a clear rationale for why the problem you selected deserves new research. How you write that paragraph will determine what journals you can submit your paper to. There are two parts to your introduction that reveal your audience. Your study's motivation and your study's contributions. A key criterion in the review process is whether the manuscript is a good fit for a particular journal and its readership. The motivation of the study can influence a journal editor's decision on the fitness of a submitted manuscript. Suppose, for example, that you state that this is the motivation for your paper. Poor labor force quality in the developing world. If you submit it to the Journal of Agricultural Economics, that journal's editor will likely find your paper unfit for its readership. Based on the problem underlying your study, as stated in the motivating paragraph of your introduction, your audience is more likely to be found in a development journal, and to some extent, a labor economics journal if the contributions have broader implications. The type of problem you study determines your audience. If your paper's topic determines your audience, its contributions to the literature determine how broad that audience can be. Let us go back to the example discussed in the previous slide. Your topic is poor labor force quality in the developing world. Suppose your research question links this problem to low educational attainment and that you answer this question using data from Zimbabwe. Suppose your main contribution is a novel identification strategy that can be applied to labor force issues in other countries, irrespective of their level of development. In that case, in addition to development journals, your audience is likely to include the readership of labor economics and applied econometrics journals. We are talking about a very broad audience here. The implication is that if a Tier 1 development journal rejects your initial submission, Instead of submitting it to a Tier 2 development journal after the needed revision, you may submit it to a Tier 1 labor economics journal or applied econometrics journal. That's the advantage of having a paper whose results have broader implications. This increases the chances of publishing in a prominent journal, one with a vast readership. By contrast, if your main contribution is a new Zimbabwe dataset, you are limited to development journals. Rejection by a Tier 1 journal will then send it to a lower tier development journal, as this is the only alternative for publishing your research. This example illustrates the importance of writing papers with broader implications. This is not to say that writing a paper with a narrow focus is bad, but it reduces the chances of publishing your research. What is the review process? As mentioned in the previous slide, the review process is when your peers in your field of research evaluate the quality and potential contribution of a manuscript you have written. Most journals now use a two-pronged review process. In the pre-screening stage, the decision editor, either the editor, a co-editor, or an associate editor, scans the paper to gain an independent view of the work. The manuscript is not usually accepted at this stage but it can be rejected, a process known as desk rejection. In the second stage, if the paper is not desk rejected in the pre-screening process, the editor in charge next proceeds to select referees to whom the manuscript will be sent to for a thorough independent review. In the initial examination of your manuscript, the decision editor will generally read the abstract. The primary goal in reading the abstract is to understand the research question. Is it clearly defined, relevant, and supported by the methodology? In doing so, the editor in charge then determines whether a. the manuscript is an excellent fit for the journal, and b. the quality of the paper rises to the standard of the journal. Two possible actions are taken with a manuscript at this pre-screening stage. A a desk rejection of the manuscript, 
or B, moving it to the refereeing process. A decision is usually reached within one week, but it could be much longer, depending on the journal. At this stage, given that journals usually face limited space allowance, a paper is rejected because A, it is outside the area of coverage of the journal, B, it is below the standard of papers published in the journal, which often means that the research question is deemed to be poorly conceptualized, or C, it is judged to make only a marginal contribution to the field. Well over 50% of the initial submissions are desk rejected. To minimize the odds of a desk rejection, the following is suggested. It's important not to rush the submission process. The pressure to publish sometimes can create the urge to rush a paper that is not ready. Make sure you present your paper to a group of colleagues at seminars or conferences to help inform your judgment of its readiness. Make sure you follow the rules on how to write an adequate abstract. A poor abstract will make it easier to get a desk rejection. Your paper's title must be informative and the introductory section must be written in a way that clearly demonstrates that the paper is relevant to the journal's readership. Make sure to apply the spell check thoroughly to avoid any lingering language irritant. If you can afford professional proofreading, do not hesitate to use it. And avoid charges of plagiarism by adequately citing every reference. When a manuscript passes the pre-screening process, the editor in charge selects peer reviewers with recognized subject area expertise. This is where your literature review can become crucial to your paper being accepted. More often than not, the editor will select referee among authors whose papers you reference in your literature review. Adequate referencing of existing works, therefore, is paramount to your chances of publication. A referee who is incorrectly referenced in your paper is more likely to develop a negative view of the paper and be less enthusiastic about recommending it for publication. The referee's primary role is to advise the editor on the extent to which your paper makes a significant contribution to the literature. Because most referees are often very busy, they are encouraged to first look for reasons to reject the paper. Therefore, part of preparing your paper for publication is to make sure you do not present referees with reasons to recommend that the editor reject your paper. Note that if referees recommend rejection, rarely will the editor overturn their decision. But even if all referees recommend accepting your paper, the editor has the last word and can still reject the paper. A paper can be rejected for multiple reasons. Here are a sample of them. An inadequate review of the literature, inappropriate citations, an unclear introduction, ambiguous research questions, flaws in the methodology, a poor writing style, the paper does not add new knowledge to the underlying literature, for example, it makes only a marginal contribution, and the paper cannot compete in quality with other papers published by the journal. We touched a little bit on this subject in the previous slide, but let me reiterate my points here. In preparing your paper for submission to a journal, you want to make sure it does not display any of the problems listed above. Therefore, take the following actions before submitting your paper. Discuss your paper with colleagues. If you are a graduate student, present it in your graduate student workshop or join a study group at your institution and present your paper there. If you happen to teach a graduate class, that is also an excellent environment to test your ideas. During the graduate program, many of our professors often presented preliminary versions of their papers in our class. Look for opportunities to present your papers at conferences. If your paper is accepted at conferences or at annual meetings of professional academic associations, that's a good indication that your idea is interesting. You may also reach out to scholars in your field for comments, particularly, particularly if you use an empirical method they developed or use themselves. 
Depending on how you phrase your inquiry, you might get a positive answer. Most of the points I, ju I just made are supposed to help you learn how to defend the scientific validity of your methodology, particularly in the introductory section. Finally, if you have a pretty good idea of the level of contributions your paper makes, choose the journal accordingly and avoid aiming too high. It is important and ambitious, but realistic as well, so a balance is needed. Even if your work is in the area of development, you can still publish it in a general interest journal. However, keep in mind that a general interest journal often has a readership that looks for contributions with broader implications. Its primary purpose is to provide information in a general manner to a broad audience of scholars. Such a journal accepts submissions from all fields of study. How do you know you can submit your paper to a general interest journal? To be able to do this, make sure that in your abstract and introduction, you clearly demonstrate that the problem your paper is studying is relevant to a large family of environments, not just a single country or community, even though you use data from a specific country to explore its causes or consequences. For example, suppose you are exploring the long-term implications of a child's exposure to poverty using data from South Africa. In your introduction, argue that children are exposed to poverty in nearly all countries, although not in the same proportion. In that context, it will become clear that understanding the long-term consequences of such exposure has global implications, not just for children in South Africa. And you also want to make sure that the main contributions of your paper are general enough. Let us return to the example of child poverty I just presented. An interesting challenge for the identification of the long-term effects of child poverty is the endogeneity of poverty. In this context, a novel strategy for identifying this long-term effect may significantly contribute to the literature on poverty, and this can enhance your chances of publishing in a general interest journal. Field journals or subject-specific journals target a readership with an exclusive focus on a specific subject. For example, international economics, macroeconomics, or industrial organization. Such journals accept submissions deemed relevant to a given area of specialization. For example, the primary purpose of the Journal of Development Economics is to provide information in a general manner to a broad audience of development scholars. Examples of field journals include, but are not restricted to, the Journal of Development Economics, the Journal of Population Economics, and the Journal of International Economics. Here is a non-exhaustive list of development journals. The Journal of Development Economics, Economics Development and Cultural Change, the World Bank Economic Review, World Development, the Journal of African Economies, the Journal of Development Studies, the Review of Development Economics, and the Review of Income and Wealth. Some are more narrow in focus than others. Among the limited focus journals are the Review of Income and Wealth, which is focused on poverty issues, and the Journal of African Economies, where a paper must use data from an African country. Development journals publish studies that use theoretical and empirical approaches to examine aspects of economic development. These include studies focused on micro and macro aspects of economic development, structural barriers to economic development, and cultural change. You can submit your work to a development journal if your topic is linked to development either from a microeconomic or a macroeconomic point of view. Examples include analysis of the policy impact of intervention programs such as the conditional cash transfer programs, the effect of harmful traditions such as child marriage on development outcomes, school construction programs, etc. You can also submit your paper to a development journal if your main contribution has no implications beyond the development. You need to identify a journal that serves your purpose. 
Submitting a paper to an unsuitable journal is a significant cause of article desk rejection. The most common mistake young scholars make is not knowing the body of research in which an article fits. Choosing the wrong journal for publishing spells outright rejection, even if the paper is very encouraging with sound and rigorous scholarly work. Therefore, when looking for a journal to submit your paper to, take the time to review each journal's aims and scope and determine which is suitable for your manuscript. The sections and questions below will help you make the best choice when deciding where to, pub to publish your research. Browse through the journals in your field of study. Most journals describe their scope on the front page of their website. Carefully read the scope of each journal to find out if the journal serves your purpose. In so doing, address the following questions. Does the journal have a wide range of topics or is it more focused? This is the first and most straightforward question to address. It is about whether the journal is a general interest journal or a field journal. For example, a subject-specific journal. Subject-specific journals only consider papers relevant to, their, relevant to their primary subject, for example, development. If your article is cross-disciplinary or covers multiple research fields, then a broader scope journal will be more suitable for your paper. Once you know the aims and scopes of the journals you are looking at, these will provide you with a clear understanding of what kind of research they consider. After you identify the type of journal most suitable for your paper, general interest or subject specific, there are still questions you must address before deciding to submit. For example, what type of content has the journal published previously? This question is a little harder to address because doing so requires that you browse through the journal website to look for the kind of content the journal publishes. For example, does it publish CGE papers? Does it accept applied theory papers? Or does it restrict its scope to empirical papers exclusively? Look at journals that have published articles on your topic previously. This is an encouraging sign that your work may appeal to the journal editors. What is the impact factor of the journal? Another indication of the suitability of the journal for your paper is to look at the impact factor. The impact factor the frequency with which the average article in a journal has been cited in a particular year. A journal's impact factor gives you an idea of the journal's quality and how difficult it will be to get your paper accepted. High impact journals usually receive many submissions for the space available because they are the most targeted by papers' authors. That means they also tend to have the lowest acceptance rate for unsolicited submissions. So make sure you strike a good balance between the journal's impact factor and its acceptance rate. How long does it take to receive decisions on a submission to a journal? Nowadays, scholars are judged by the quantity as much as the quality of their publications. This creates an enormous pressure to publish so that how long a journal takes before reaching a final decision on a submitted manuscript matters more today than it did in the past. Knowing this information about the publication process means that you will understand when you can expect to hear from a journal editor or when your paper will be published. All journals have all of this information displayed so that you can make the most informed decision about where to submit your paper. To sum up, to choose a journal to submit your paper, paper to, identify the journals related to your field of study and their individual focuses, and then select a journal with a focus similar to the content of your manuscript. Look at papers recently published in your journal of interest. Ask yourself if your paper is of equal or higher caliber. If not, submit your work to a different journal.